feel so honored to be invited to this amazing series, and thank you for everyone for coming. I think this will be a really great evening. And so tonight, um, I'm going to talk about my specialty in cognitive neuroscience, which is predictive coding. And I'll be talking specifically about predictive coding in the human brain, even though this is a phenomenon that has now been studied across the animal kingdom, everything from humans down to crickets, brains use predictive coding. So, but we'll be really focusing on human brains, and so I'll show you off an image of the human brain. Specifically, this is a magnetic resonance image of my brain. Um, so, welcome to my brain. So, as a very brief introduction to the human brain, the brain is made of a diverse array of cells, and these cells are organized in a very coherent manner, in what we call a hierarchical manner, in a structure in the brain. So the brain is not uniform but instead there are very specific parts of the brain that have very specific functions. And so while each part of the brain may be able to do more than one job, not every part of the brain can do every job. And so a very quick introduction to the human brain. We can see that we have the temporal lobe, and in the temporal lobe, that's really where uh, it has a number of jobs. One of the main functions is that's where primary auditory cortex is housed. While back in the occipital lobe, we see that's where primary visual cortex is housed. And so each of these parts of the brain actually really have their specialization. But it's important to know that in a healthy individual, that the various parts of the brain and both hemispheres of the brain are very highly connected with these very high speed passageways that allows information to be moved and integrated and compared very rapidly across all parts of the brain. But it's not very anatomy talk, it's predictive coding talk. So let's talk about what the world's sensory environment is. So the world is an extremely complex sensory environment. I mean, think about it right here. You hear my voice, you have all these colors, these lights, these beautiful paintings and photographs. You have the noise from the people around you. You have the echo of my voice, there's street noise, there's people walking around. You have the chair under you. You can feel your clothing, you can feel your muscles, you can feel yourself breathing. You're constantly being inundated with enormous quantities of sensory information. And there's so much sensory information that the brain actually needs to have some sort of creative strategy to manage it all. It's all too much information for us to be taking in everything brand new coming in for the first time. So how does the brain manage this really complex sensory world in order to have the appropriate reactions to the appropriate stimuli? I shouldn't be responding to every single stimulus I had in the room at this time. I need to have appropriate stimuli for the context. And so one of the leading theories for how we manage all of this inundation of sensory information is that we actually create a model of our environment and we have an internal representation of the world constantly in our brain. So as I'm standing here, I can feel my feet on the floor, I can feel my leg and trunk muscles, you know, keeping me erect, I can hear my own voice, um, and I also, I can see the audience, and everyone's in your seat. And I'm like, pretty confident that you've been in your seat for a little while and that you're probably gonna stay here. I'm also constantly thinking, what am I gonna say next? What am I gonna say? I'm working that out. <laughs> then I'm actually saying, okay, I need to coordinate my breathing, my vocal muscles. Yeah. Is it a Battery. Okay. How does it sound? Are we getting better or worse? That's better. Yeah? Okay, good. Great. Awesome. Okay, well, just let me know. Also, interrupt with questions at any point. I'm totally happy with interruptions. I want to make sure everyone's enjoying it on the same page. So, I was saying that I'm, I'm trying to work out what I'm going to say. And in order to speak, speech is actually incredibly complicated. I've got to coordinate all my respiration. I've got to also get my vocal folds to constrict. I've got my tongue, I've got my jaw, I've got my lips. All of this needs to be coordinated extremely rapidly in order for me to produce this speech. But I'm doing it, I'm producing my speech, but I'm also hearing myself speak, and I'm having to constantly hear and monitor my voice to make sure the correct things are coming out of my voice. Is this okay still? Or? It's hair. Oh, it's hair, okay. We'll see if that improves it. Thank you. Um, but anyways, all of this, all of the sensory information is coming together to form my model of the current environment. But, in the theory of neuroprodictive coding, 
we're not just looking at what is the model of my current environment, but I'm actually predicting what is the next bit of sensory information I'm going to be receiving. So I've been standing on this floor for a while. I'm pretty confident it's gonna still be here. So I really don't need to be taking the time or the neural effort to be constantly processing that the floor is still under me. I have more important things I should be worrying about. Similarly, as I see the audience continue to sit here, you're continuing to be here, this is proper information, and I'm gonna keep an eye on that. But as long as everyone's still there, that's gonna match my model, and we don't need to process it anymore. But if, on the other hand, everyone just got up and left right now, everyone's running through the door, that's gonna um, be a mismatch with my prediction. And that's actually gonna be a surprise, and that'll be an error that I really need to address. Maybe there's something going on behind me. What is going on? This is important salient information I need to respond to in the moment. And that would be the prediction error that is this novel or surprising information that's really important. And that's what predictive coding allows us to do is to remove the very important salient information. Predictive coding also is used in order to monitor our own movements. So as I said, I need to be monitoring my own voice. So as I'm here thinking about what I'm going to say, I have a model for what I actually expect my voice to sound like. And as long as my speech actually sounds like this, I don't want to be processing this anymore. I need to be using all my neural resources, getting my next word, or maybe if I hear someone else speaking to me in the background, I need to be able to hear that and respond to that. But on the other hand, if while I'm speaking, I actually make a speech error, which happens all the time, it's extremely frequent, making a slip of the tongue, a quick speech error, I want to be able to catch that right away, and I want to use that in order to immediately kick this error from my auditory cortex up to my motor cortex to correct this error. So the idea of predictive coding is that we're actually building our world model, building all of our beliefs about the world through prediction errors. And I'm going to be using the word belief a lot. I'm not using the word belief in the sense of a social belief or a religious belief, but actually the belief is the belief in the world around us, so belief in the sensory environment, our internal representation of what the world is. And in predictive coding, we have these prediction errors that are the mismatch between our predictions and the actual sensory environment being evaluated in the lower level system and then kicked up to the higher parts of the brain in order to update what that worldview is. And then we get this feedback from that worldview, from those higher centers, back into the lower level areas in order to then have a new prediction error and set new predictions and update from there and learn from our experience. And I think for me, one of the most salient examples of predictive coding in our everyday life is in music. So everyone knows, has heard a song that they love, a song that they experience all the time, and then somebody misses a note, or they drop the note, they skip the note, something goes wrong, and you pick that out immediately. It's incredibly salient when a single note in a complex musical piece is messed up. And that's because as you're listening to this very dynamic piece, you actually have a representation, an expectation of what the next piece of music is going to be, what the next note is. And when you have that mismatch, it's actually incredibly striking. The other thing that's incredibly striking, though, is that you can actually hear these mistakes um, built in a new piece that you've never heard before, or even just in a chord, progression of chords. So I'm going to play a progression of chords, and out of two of these, there are there's an implicit error that I think everyone will immediately catch up on. Okay, we'll see if the sound works. Maybe not. Make sure you just unplug the. Are there any musicians who can? I mean, so what it comes down to is 
When you have a failure and a progression, any sort of progression, any sort of expectation, even if it's something completely novel, when it's violated, it's still wrong. So if you think of just simple musical notes that are ascending, and you hear five notes that are ascending, and then suddenly we have a descending note, that alone is going to be a violation of that expectancy. So it's something as simple as that with music is very strong and very salient. So in a mini summary, the world is really a complex, multi-central sensory environment that's full of information. And the brain needs to process this information in an efficient manner to facilitate the appropriate reactions. And so predictive coding is a strategy to efficiently process the vast amounts of information in the world. So what it says is that the brain creates predictions of the sensory environment, the expected information is then allowed to be processed efficiently, and novel information is especially salient. But what are the implications of this? I mean, there's some pretty profound implications that come out of this. So first we have that every percept in the world is now updating your internal model, everything you're experiencing in all of your sensory systems. So every time we have a pairing that we need to either compare with our, all of our previous experience in our life to see, is this just a coincidence or is this a true pairing? I'm very confident that cars have wheels. And this is a true parent. This is a coupling that we have experienced. But there are other couplings that could be accidental and happen at the same time just because they happen to be in your same visual space. But also that's very important is that our experience of the world is based on, on the basic sensory level, like on our lowest level of cortex, is dependent on our previous knowledge of it. So every experience that we have is affected by what we believe. And again, this is belief in the sense of our internal model of the world. And then, the corollary to that, the extent to which we update our beliefs is completely dependent on what is the new sensory information we take in, what are the new experiences we have in our lives, visually and through all our senses, will update our internal model. So what this means is that the experiences that do not challenge the belief system that we've already created, this internal model of the world, they become predictable, and they no longer need attention, and they can be ignored. So every time I see a car, I'm not like, oh wow, they're wheels. This is exciting. This should be ignored information. So this is wonderful. The advantage is that we're saving all of that computational time, all of that inefficiency and energy. We can be focused on more necessary neural processing. But at the same time, there's the disadvantage of the system, which means the system becomes incredibly inflexible. And this means that strong belief can lead one to ignore otherwise important information. And so this is a real problem, and this is something that's been experimentally shown that we can actually have what's called a blocking effect, where we fail to update and learn new information when there's other very strongly held beliefs blocking that information. And so what it means is that the model that one builds about the world, these beliefs you have, has a big impact on all of your perception. So what is the scientific evidence we have for neural predictive coding? Well, we have a few decades of research looking into behavior, human behavior, and also looking into animal predictive coding. But I really want to focus on the human neuroimaging that actually allows us to non-invasively examine human brains and understand how is this predictive coding occurring. And so I want to do a very quick introduction to the three main non-invasive human imaging approaches. So the first of which is electroencephalography, abbreviated EEG. And what EEG is, it's a way to measure, um, <laughs> so it's done with a, it's actually often done with a cap which allows all of these white electrodes to be placed in specific places on the head. And those electrodes are measuring the electric fields caused by the coherent um, activity of um, your neurons. So when a person thinks your neurons are active and there causes a change in the electric fields and when enough neurons work together doing a task that these can actually be measured by the EEG and what you get from each of these electrodes you get an output that looks kind of like this which is a crazy bunch of noisy waveforms but these noisy waveforms actually have really coherent information embedded in them and if you appropriately design your experiment you're actually able to then 
extract coherent information from these noisy waveforms. So for example, this is evidence from a person listening to a, a passive recording of their own voice, and this blue deflection is their auditory cortex responding to hearing their own voice. So another popular technique is magnetoencephalography that's met, um, abbreviated MEG. And so this is done in a much larger device, and it requires a person to sit or lie in the MEG machine with their head basically in a helmet, with the sensors now are actually embedded in this helmet. And similarly, instead of um, measuring the electric field changed by this coherent activity of the neurons, we're now measuring the changes in the magnetic fields at the surface of the brain. So we also get these kind of crazy waveforms looking, um, coming out of each of these sensors. But what's really cool about magnetic fields as opposed to electric fields is that when they hit the skull, they don't blur. So magnetic fields are able to pass through the skull without changing. And this is really special because what this allows us to do much more easily than with EEG is actually not just look at what, is, what does the brain activity look like at the sensors, but we can say, what does this brain activity look like at the sources? And so we're actually able to do these source reconstructions to say what part of cortex is responding during this task. And so this is an average of several people listening to themselves speaking. So this is again that passive listening. And the last very popular technique in neuroimaging is the functional MRI. And the functional MRI is a special sequence of acquisition that can be done in an MRI machine that allows us to actually measure the hemodynamic response. So what we're then measuring is the changes in blood oxygenation caused by actually the neurons being active. The neural activity in the brain changes the blood flow and we're measuring that blood oxygenation. And we're once again able to have these very strong, um, precise spatial localization and maps of where the activity is occurring in the brain. But because the brain is extremely busy, we're not just going to ask someone to put an EEG cap on and, you know, dance and, you know, try to touch their toes and pat their belly and rub their head and all of it. At the same time, we want to use really simple tasks in order to isolate the very specific activity. And also the most simple tasks are the, can be the most elegant because they can be transferred across participants of all cognitive abilities and all ages. So we really love to have these elegant, short, simple tasks. And one of which is the mismatch negativity task. And with the mismatch negativity task, it takes what we call an oddball sequence. And it can be either visual or auditory. And what it is, is a sequence of repetitive stimuli. In the most simple form, it would just be a series of tones that you hear over and over again. The same tone that we call a standard, represented by the blue square here. But after you hear the standard for a long time, you, you create a prediction that the next time you hear a stimuli, it's probably gonna be that same tone. But if we randomly embed in the sequence a different tone, maybe one of a higher pitch, or that's a little bit louder, or a little bit shorter, then that would actually be the deviant tone represented here by this green square. And just by passively listening to this, we're actually able to measure a prediction error because people build a prediction of hearing that standard stimuli. And then the neural response to that deviant stimuli actually signaling a prediction error. And this is an amazing task because it does not require the participant's attention. It's gonna actually even be done in a person with a coma. And it's generally used while someone's doing a completely different distractor task, maybe they're doing some challenging math. So what we get out, and this is um, the recording actually directly from a person's auditory cortex and listening to one of these very simple mismatch negativity tasks, where you can see that this thin black line is the, stand, is the neural response in this person's auditory cortex to the standard. This is the standard auditory production. Um, and they have this very small positive deflection, but it's fairly small, as opposed to the deviant, this unexpected, possibly just a slightly higher pitch, we get this very large upwards deflection in the auditory cortex. And when you subtract these two signals, you actually get this difference wave that is called the mismatch negativity. And it's this mismatch negativity that's actually that prediction error. So this is one of the first examples of where we really saw the predictive coding in the brain. And I can go through all the details of why this is predictive coding and nothing else, but that's a, a long history of experiments that we can ask questions on later.
So there's also been an immense amount of work looking into motor predictive coding. So motor predictive coding allows for us not only to monitor our own movements for errors, but also allows us to distinguish between self-produced sensations and externally produced sensations. So when I move, and I, when I move to um, you know, advance the slides or as I'm walking around, I can use my vision to make sure that my hand is moving in the right position. I can also use my proprioception to make sure I'm touching the key and I'm hitting the right key. At the same time, I can also tell the difference when I move my hair or I touch my skin with my own hand versus if somebody else did the same thing. I'm distinguishing a self from an um, outside or a non-self-produced action. And this is very important. This is why we can't tickle ourselves because we're actually able to predict that the tickle is going to happen and then we ignore it implicitly. So this is a very, in a healthy person, the distinction between self and non-self is one of the most important things we can do. And one of the places we do this most importantly is also with our speech. So as we're speaking, we're constantly telling whether or not our speech is different from the external sounds. And so the experiments into speech often have a person speaking into a microphone and hearing their auditory feedback in real time. And we collect neuroimaging data during it. So in a very simple experiment, we'll, a person will, we'll have a recording of a person's own voice and we'll play it back to them while they're just passively listening to their own voice. Something as simple as a single vowel, ah. And they hear and we see this large response in the auditory cortex. This is representative of what the response in the auditory cortex would look like. And after they have this large auditory response, we think, well, what would their auditory response actually be if they're producing it themselves. Remember I said that with predictive coding, we don't want to pay attention to things we know are going to happen. So we actually see if a person speaks and hears their own voice in real time, no change, no mistake, we see a much smaller auditory response. And so this is actually a suppressed response. It's the same type of response, but it's much smaller because we don't need to be paying attention to our own voice if we knew it was gonna happen and it comes out correctly. And this has been called, termed speaking induced suppression. So how do we know this is predictive coding? Well, part of that evidence actually comes from the fact that, yes? Just wondering, um, how that Oh, well that's actually a different thing. So this is a very good question. So the question is, why when you're on the phone and there's an echo, you, your speech messes up, you might start stuttering, you get confused, it's extremely hard to speak. And it actually is because of this feedback. So this feedback isn't just expecting to hear your, your voice in a specific pitch and specific <coughs> words and specific vowels, but it's also expecting to hear it at a very specific time. You're expecting to hear your voice after a very brief delay after it comes out of your mouth. You know, you have this bone conduction, you have air conduction, it should be extremely rapid. When you have the echo on the phone, then you can have a delay. And it can actually, this delay messes up your own feedback. And that, can, that will throw off your speech and can induce stutter. Interestingly, for a person who stutters, actually purposefully delaying that feedback can improve their stutter and allow a person to speak coherently. So it's a great question. And it actually is because part of the prediction is when it's gonna happen, not just if it's gonna happen. Yeah. When you say a higher response or a lower response, say a neuron. Yeah. What does that mean? It means more neurons are responding. Okay. Yeah. There's more blood flow, there's more signal. There's more neurons firing, there's more dendrites, you know. I mean there's more there's more so I mean so for, for the, example in a magnetic there could be more neurons firing, but it could be highly highly invisible. Or there could be fewer uh, but more from here. So um, specifically here, um, this is showing an idealized um, magnetic response. So we're seeing an increase in the coherent activity in the dendrites of neurons in auditory cortex. This has also been recorded directly from auditory cortex and where we're looking at single neuron firing and that also shows the same behavior. We're in a single neuron, either in human or non-human primates and other non-human animals that the actual activity down to the single neuro, the neuronal level, that the neuronal firing increases is higher when a, a higher person rate or an animal is higher rate. 
So neurons are they're all or nothing. There isn't like, oh, this one neuron is going to have a stronger response. It's just going to have a more frequent response. There isn't a smaller response that a neuron can give. But when I talk about more or less with humans, I'm more talking about a larger region of cortex is responding coherently together. That's a great question. Yeah. Sorry for one more. Yeah, no, please do. Um, it's a neat experiment. I'm curious. Do you have to acclimate people to the sound of their own voice before you do this? No, we're pretty comfortable with the sound of our own voice. That is something we're used to. You mean when they're passively perceiving it? So when a person is passively perceiving their voice, it does sound different. Um, it sounds strange for two reasons. One is you don't have this predictive coding happening. Um, the other is that we have bone conduction, and we're used to hearing our voice through bone conduction and not through ear bone. Um, we have done experiments, and we've shown that it doesn't really matter if you do have a person acclimate or not. It's more about whether or not, there, it all comes down to whether or not there's this timing and the sound. If the timing happens at the right time and the sound matches what's expected. And that's actually shown in this next slide. Where what we're able to do is we're able to artificially alter a person's voice so that we can induce a speech error in real time. And so if we take a person's voice, they said ah, and we slightly raise the pitch of their voice and then passively play it back to them. So now their voice is actually a little bit wrong from what they had said 10 minutes before. They'll still have that same strong auditory response to say, that's a voice, maybe that's my voice, I'm hearing it. But if we, a person speaks and we're altering their voice in real time, or this has also been captured with natural speech errors that people just produce, people are always making errors if we just look at the errors during their production. We see that we no longer have this suppression, that this suppression effect is actually dampened and destroyed because we no longer, we have have a failure to match. We have a failure to match the expectation and the perceived sensory feedback. And this is now a prediction error. Good question. Yeah. Uh, what was the interval? And just out of curiosity, is it previously intended? Sorry, what, can you say this again? Uh, sure. Yeah. The what interval between each other ends, or? Yeah, like how much you talk about I'm wondering, is the response previously intended? Like, there are certain intervals in which you know, this effect is suppressed? Oh, this is a great question. So, um, so this is actually idealized data, just to make it cleaner. Um, so I have done experiments with a wide range of changes. Um, I've done mostly pitch, because one of the things I'm interested in is actually expressing vocal emotions. And so um, what we found in the field is that making a small change, so 50 cent, 100 cents, so that would be a half step, a quarter step, um, so very small changes to the pitch will still um, reduce the amount of suppression, but will not eliminate it altogether. So that would be more along the line of a, a speech error, the natural speech errors that we can make. And we would say that the auditory response to these small errors are greater than if there were no error, but not the same as passively listening. And we interpret that as saying, okay, that is actually the prediction error being sent back to auditory cortex. But we make a large change, 300 cent or 500 cent, so it almost sounds like an alien voice at this point, then we'll completely eliminate all of the suppression because now that voice will actually be identified as a non sense um, Any other questions? Yeah. So in passive uh, listening, the person is not actually hearing their voice as they're uh, used to, right? Is it possible to modify the recording so that they hear mostly what they're used to because of the phone conduction effects? So that is something that we haven't done in the lab, but that we talk about a lot. One of the things we're experimenting now with are bone conduction headphone earphones. Well, I guess they're not earphones, but they're headphones at that point. Mm -hmm. So to actually try to um, allow for the bone conduction to be part of the experience. The other thing we have done is bone conduction is often at lower frequency. It, um, so you can actually present masking noise to mask out the bone conduction while the person's speaking and while they're listening. So it's less like their natural environment, but it makes those two environments more similar, and that does not change this effect. Yes? You can also pitch, you're still keeping the same interval on performance. Can you try changing uh, the performance intervals? Uh, yes, so, the, um, so for people, the question is, have we also altered formats? And the answer is yes. For those who don't know, a formant are actually the properties of the speech that make up the vowels. So the formants are much are much more complicated in the way that they're discrete categories. 
the vowel ah means something very different than the vowel e, even though in frequency space, these are continuous. There's actually these discrete category boundaries. So when you alter, um, so yes, you have the exact same neural and behavioral responses when you alter someone's vowel production, but as long as you're in the same category, once you cross a category boundary and you change the vowel ah to e, then the change the effects can be a little bit different and that can also start to become more that non-self representation rather than within the natural errors that a person makes. If you ask a person to say the vowel ah a hundred times, they'll say it in very different ways throughout those utterances. So we're comfortable with quite a bit of error within the vowel, but we very rarely make the mistake with the wrong vowel. Yes? Uh, I didn't hear a question, just one. Why can't I say the same thing over and over and over repeatedly? It's like a wear out. Oh, so that's a, that's a very good question. I don't know if I have the best answer for that question. I mean, it's this idea of this repetition, and it could be, um, we do know there's basically repetition fatigue, both with neurons and just more metaphysically, that that does happen, but I don't have the best answer for that question, Neur like how that works with neural predictive coding. But I think it's just, as you repeat something, as you passively perceive something, you start to ignore it more, so I think as you repeat it more, then it might start to sound strange because you're actually, as the prediction is getting more and more precise, then you pay more and more attention to the small alterations in it. So if you're expecting, if you say the word, I don't know, dog, 10 times in a row, mm -hmm. then by the end you're expecting to hear a dog, but whenever you speak, again, it's a very complicated system, there's almost always a little bit of variation in your voice. So that as you get, as the whole word dog becomes a stronger prediction, you'll actually pay more attention to these small errors and the small waverings in your voice. Yeah. Okay. So, evidence for motor predictive coding of speech. Okay, so it's important to remember that we were, I've just been giving really precise, very small, simple examples of predictive coding. But predictive coding is something that exists with all activities and all sensory um, stimuli, regardless of how complex. It's not just as simple as a single utterance. And I want to present this in terms, I know there was a talk on Bayesian statistics here a few months ago. For those here, I wanted to bring this in in terms of the Bayesian terminology. If you, have, if you don't know this terminology, it's okay, it's just about the general ideas. And so the idea is that we have these beliefs about what will happen in the world even before we get the sensory information. We hear a series of tones, we're expecting the next tone to be the same. After standing on this floor, I'm confident it's gonna be here. So in Bayesian terms, this would be the prior belief. But after observing the sensory data, we now need to update this belief and we need to change our internal model. So after we hear a different tone, maybe we'll lose our confidence and we'll actually reduce our confidence in our prediction. Similarly, if there was an earthquake now, I would reduce my confidence that this floor is gonna remain smooth. So we need to be constantly able, and this is what I'm saying, we need, to, we need to neurally be able to update our internal model at all times. So what happens if this predictive coding neural system becomes disorganized? What happens when it's disruptive? And I'm going to talk about one of the effects, which is that several leading scientists are now interpreting the symptoms of schizophrenia in terms of neuropredictive coding errors. And now it's very important to realize that schizophrenia is extremely heterogeneous neuropsychiatric disorder. Not everything I'm saying is going to apply to everyone with schizophrenia. For example, auditory hallucinations are very common in schizophrenia, but not every person with schizophrenia will have auditory hallucinations. The other thing I'm not going to address or even touch on is what is the actual true underlying cause of this neuropsychiatric disorder. We know that it's partially genetic and partially environmental, but that's not what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to really talk about how can predictive coding help us understand and interpret it and facilitate treatment. And so the idea is, really, again, we're basing all of this um, interpretation on this notion that the brain is really this inference machine, and that it's constantly trying to create hypotheses about the world and predict our upcoming sensations. 
And if these inferences are wrong then, that can actually cause these false concepts, these delusions, and these false precepts, the hallucinations, that are really the hallmarks of schizophrenia. And so what I'm saying is actually that schizophrenia can be a problem in the balance between that confidence you have in the prediction and the amount that you need to then weight the sensory information to update your prediction. With the idea that the abnormalities lie in the patient's ability to distinguish relevant and irrelevant information and their over-reliance on irrelevant information. Not on the stories they make up to explain this irrelevant information, but actually the fact that this irrelevant information is getting unnecessary attention. So the first thing I want to show is that we know that predictive coding is disrupted in schizophrenia. One of the most replicated neurophysiological markers in schizophrenia, repeated in every study, is disrupted mismatch negativity. And so this is a figure I stole from a recent paper that came out by Rachel Hay in 2015, but this has been replicated in dozens of papers, that in simple predictive toning tasks like the mismatch negativity, patients with schizophrenia repeatedly show deficits. So what we see is we see that we have the healthy volunteer participants in blue, and we see that regardless of the type of deviant that we're seeing, we see a strong mismatch negativity response. And what we see is with patients early in their illness of schizophrenia, this is not this is before they've had long-term medication, this is before any of the neural effects of a long-term illness, but early in their illness, we're still seeing this repeatable decrease in mismatch negativity. So even early in illness, we're seeing yes. Could you clarify what this experiment is saying? No. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay. So this is that mismatch negativity task that I was talking about before. So in this task, the subjects are hearing beeps. So they're just hearing beep, beep, beep. And then, every once in a while, with the frequency deviant, it's a slightly higher pitch. And with the frequency and duration deviant, it's slightly higher pitch and slightly longer. With duration, it's just slightly longer. And with the intensity deviant, it's slightly louder, slightly quieter. So this is just saying, almost all of the beeps are gonna just be the beep, and that's the standard. And we're gonna compare that to one of these deviant responses. And it's that mismatch negativity response that we were talking about before, which is really that evidence of the prediction error. And we see that in the blue, across all deviants, that these healthy volunteer subjects who come into the lab show this very strong, automatic response to the deviant. These subjects are doing a visual task. They're told to ignore their auditory stream. They're not even paying attention. They're doing these hard math problems. They're doing visual matching. They're doing reading. They're doing all sorts of distractions. And in the background, their auditory cortex is implicitly recognizing that this is an error in the sequence. The patients early in their schizophrenic illness are failing at that. They're not doing it as well. Yeah. What's the difference between prediction and habituation? So that's a very good question. And that is not as well represented in this version of the paradigm, but that's extremely um, well proven in the fact that it doesn't actually have to be the same tone over and over again that would be in the oddball sequence. It can actually be a series of tones that creates a pattern. So this could have, instead of being the same tone over, and this, we would get the same results as has been shown, that if you listen to an ascending scale, and then there's a single note that deviates from this ascending scale, so there's, a, there's no chance of habituation. We have a progression, and we have an organized progression. When there's a when there's a deviation from that progression, then we still have a failure to have the mismatch um, recognized. Or if there's even a more complicated musical piece where there's a pattern, any deviation of that pattern. So yes, habituation could explain it in a, the more simple sense, but it doesn't. So as I said, auditory hallucinations are one of the most common symptoms of schizophrenia. And how can auditory hallucinations be explained by predictive coding? And really, one of the ways we can actually explain auditory hallucinations is if patients with schizophrenia are failing to attenuate their own sensory input from their own motor actions. So specifically, when, as I said, when I'm speaking, when any healthy individual is speaking, 
I am dampening down my auditory response to my own voice because it is what I predict. And that's how I'm able to distinguish my voice from somebody at a party who has maybe a similar tone and cadence and is even talking on the same topic or even choral speech. I can tell my voice apart from this other person's. If we take away this ability to tell my, my voice apart from somebody else's, then that can make it increasingly complicated to then to also tell the difference between inner speech and outer speech. So we all have inner speech. We have voices in our head as we're thinking. It can be your own voice as you're you know, listing off your chores for the day, uh, what you have to get done. It can also be somebody else's voice. The most salient is if you have a song stuck in your head, it's rarely in your own voice that you have the song stuck, but you actually are hearing the musician perform the song as you hear it on the radio in your own head. And as a healthy individual, it's very easy to distinguish between self-produced and externally produced. But if this distinction between self and non-self is damaged, then it could be that that actually makes it harder to distinguish the source of these voices. And so we have evidence, um, and this is from a paper that's coming out soon um, that I've done, a study that I've done, looking at healthy volunteer subjects monitoring their own voice and patients with schizophrenia. And what we see is, this is measuring EEG, um, looking at auditory responses to a person's own voice. And now if we see one person is saying just the vowel ah, we're now seeing a negative deflection because this is EEG versus MEG. It's the same idea though, that we see this very strong auditory response in blue. <coughs> but when a person's talking and hearing their own voice, we see a much smaller, this very small deflection. In red. So this is when someone's hearing their own voice. Auditory cortex is suppressed. In the patients with schizophrenia, we see that the suppression is reduced. So we're actually seeing a failure to distinguish the self from the non-self. We also have evidence for a faulty inference in patients with delusions. So in this very simple behavioral task, there's an urn. It can be virtual or it can be physical. And I fill it with marbles. And, but you can't see inside, and I say, you can take the marbles out one at a time, and I want you to tell me when you know what color is the majority in this urn. And let's say I fill it with 85% blue marbles and 15% red. Well, the first question is, how, tell me as quickly as you know. How many, you can pull out as many as you want, but whenever you're ready, tell me what, what color is the majority. And we see that patients with delusions repeatedly jump to conclusions. They're actually answering this question, possibly even after the first marble comes out, when you simply do not have enough information to answer this question. But conversely, they're then told, well, you can continue to take out as many marbles as you want, and you can change your mind as often as you like. And what we repeatedly see is that patients with delusions are actually changing their choice more rapidly. So they're weighting this new information more than the past information. And so what this sh shows evidence is that there seems to be this greater influence of the new sensory information rather than this old repeated sensory information. And this pairs with some of the things that we know about delusions just from conversations with individuals who have suffered from them. And we have quotations that are along the lines of, wherever you are looking, everything looks unreal when they're in a delusion. Or people look confusing, they're almost like they're made up. People that I know have masks on, or they're disguising themselves. It's like a big play, like a big production story. So we're really saying, we're getting this feeling that some of these patients who have suffered from delusions describe the delusional state as a strange, weird, bizarre world where things are confusing. But at the same time, we've also gotten reports from these same people that suddenly in this strange world, a single, seemingly irrelevant object takes un, unprecedented importance, an amount of importance that they can't really attribute normally. So we start to have this new, mysterious, bewildering reasons for the object. And we start to have something like the sight of a limping man was reported to have the impression of the devil hunting a patient. Or the stroke of the bell in a bell tower was announcing his imminent death. Or there was a patient who, when he saw, the, when he was given the salt shaker, he interpreted that he needed to go home 
because the Pope was visiting him and you know he wanted to see his family and reward them. So these are these otherwise innocuous, and these are actually like real stories from a person who is in, you know, who's reporting on the state, maybe after they're back on medication and they're more stable. They're saying, this is what I experienced, and I know it's bizarre, but what it is is not that it's not that this story is actually crazy. It's that if all of a sudden the salt shaker is so important that a logical story or a somewhat logical story is constructed to explain why this innocuous stimulus is all of a sudden getting all of your attention. So what is the link between predictive coding and psychosis? Well, we, we're thinking that the failure of predictive coding is leading to this failure to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant information. And that allows this unreasonable amount of attention um, to relevant stimuli that can lead to this formation of these, like, of these beliefs that can then lead to delusions. And that the failure to distinguish itself from non-self can also, with externally produced speech, can lead to auditory hallucinations. <coughs> yes? In the examples that you gave, the story itself is not part of predictive coding, right? It's just like a separate process, given that there is an error to break from the explanation. Oh, no, that's part of it. So this, the same idea is that this is because of predictive coding. So we're used to having um, expected situations not to receive a lot of attention in our lives. So an example that was given is um, if you're driving, if you've never driven a car, and all of a sudden the dash, the check engine light pops on, and the, you've never driven a car, you've never seen the check engine light, it's just like another light on this complicated dashboard, you would think that your passenger would be like, uh-oh, you gotta pull over now and go to the shop. You would think that that was a crazy delusional response. It doesn't seem appropriate. There's, what, 50 lights on your dashboard and one more appears, and now you're saying, I've got to pull over and go to the shop immediately. But in fact, because you have the context of what that means, it's actually the appropriate response. So you start to have something innocuous, like a salt shaker or a bell, all of a sudden receiving all of your cognitive attention. Then a story to explain why that happens is that mismatch, that unreasonable amount of attention do a failure predictive coding, then the story, and yes, the story might be a little bit more bizarre, and that's other, you know, other neural processes going on of why the story um, tends to be persecution rather than, I don't know, a positive thing, um, but it has to do with this predictive coding. Yeah. So another one that seems to be, um, in another very common disorder that seems to be involved with prediction, predictive coding disruption is autism and the failure to appropriately parse the sensory world. Yes. Is superstition the version of this? So this is actually interesting. So I think one thing that's important to remember with delusions is that delusions are only delusions if they're inappropriate to your social and societal context. So. If you're a person who is raised in a family or in a social context that superstitions are appropriate and that the pairing of, and then the pairing of stimuli of seeing a black cat and then tripping and falling, if that is a paired stimuli that's supposed to receive salience and importance, then that is not an error in predictive coding. That is appropriate for your social context. So predictive coding is this complicated social thing as well. Yes. Just kind of comment on that, but you went back to time, you know, 500 years and convinced people that everything's made of like jiggling little like atoms. That's not a part of your like thought experience. It's absolutely insane, right? Exactly. So it really comes about 
what is your personal experience of the world and whether or not your in the moment experience is appropriate given the social and um, neuronal constructs that have been built. Well, what about superstitions that aren't handed to you by culture, but like a lot of athletes will develop the superstition? You know? But they're in a social context that superstitions are something that are given weight and importance. And we all are. Like living in the United States, we understand that superstitions are things that are it's appropriate, potentially appropriate to give a weight and importance. I mean, another example in you know recent history, it was more appropriate to um, see the devil in someone, and for how to actually think when someone's acting bizarrely that that could be interpreted as the devil possessing them. And that's something that still some people in their personal, social, and religious concepts that is appropriate. And that person might not be delusional. That might be appropriate for what they've learned and what they experience and the way they see the world. <coughs> Um, so the social constructs not, notwithstanding, to what extent can we bring in deja vu to this? Because it's a sort of delusion. It seems like something that would also be caused by some thing in the code. Yes. Um, so the deja vu experience can definitely be thought of in terms of predictive coding. And it can also be just um, when you again see this pairing of a previous experience with your current sensory environment. So it's often you hear something, you're like, I think I've been here before, I think I've done this before. And it's because when you're constantly doing this comparison between your memory, for your lifetime experience, and your current social, uh, social or society or sensory environment, when you have this comparison, and that comparison somehow lines up in an inappropriate way, I think that can cause a deja vu experience. Yeah. Is there a relation between predictive coding and and what? Information bubble, information biases. I'm not sure if I know that term. Confirmation. Confirmation bias. And can you give me an example of what you mean by that? Um, like, uh, if you if you uh, tend to associate with certain type of people, then if they, they are all kind of homogeneous, then you kind oh. of uh, uh, refer to that the world, everyone. So, uh, so yes, um, so the question is about your social environment. And I'm gonna just take this like 10 steps back and talk about it in the sensory experience. If your sensory experience is very homogeneous, regardless of the social or um, racial or ethnic makeup of your environment, or if it's very homogeneous because you happen to have the same kind of books on your shelf, any type of sensory experience comes down to a sensory experience. Of course, with people, it's much more complex and it's social and it's much more nuanced. But it is true that the more you are used to something, the more that that will become that will be dampened down and require less neural information. And the more that something deviates from that, whether it be a person or whether it be a motorcycle on the street, that will require more attention. Does that answer your question? prediction of the next set of the sensory context and that requires all of your memory so that's association well, that in context yeah in, in terms of prior i get that in sort of a you know, personal context and linguistic context but i'm trying to understand it uh neuronal. what is a neuronal prediction so a neuronal prediction will be represented um so i have come with the idea of representation too. so so the so the way um, a prediction exists in neurobiology, the easiest way to tweak it is in the gain of the neuron. So how easy it is, so we have that first neuron that says, I just heard something. And whether or not that neuron can pass that information on farther, that can be altered. Okay. So on that level, we're able to then have this prediction then stop the processing stop at that point by changing the, the ability of neurons to fire. Exactly. Yeah. 
so that's been leading to predictive coding in a different way. So that is when you actually try to look at your eyes in the mirror, you don't really see them moving because while they're moving, they're moving. <laughs> um, no, it, it, so it's not actually a joke. It's because while the, while we're actually moving our eyes, um, we're actually having. So if you think about it in terms of what is being put against our put against our retina, if you just look, think about how the eye works, there's light coming into the eye. It's being projected onto the retina, just like there's a projection onto this screen. If this if this screen now moves. The retina can't tell straight from there whether it's the screen moving or the projector moving. It will look exactly the same. There will still be the light moving across the projecting screen, regardless if the projector is moving or the screen is moving. So predictive coding is absolutely essential for us not to go crazy every time we move our eyes and think the world is spinning and an earthquake is happening and it's all coming to an end because the world is now moving. So we actually need to damp down and turn off some of the visual input during the movement and predict and understand that a movement is happening. Because otherwise, it feels really crazy. And this can happen if anyone's been, I don't know if anyone else has had this, but sometimes when you're in an airplane and you can't quite tell if you're taxiing and if you're moving or you're not, and you see the other plane going by, and you have to take a second to be like, is it moving or am I? Because you can't tell, and it, because it, see, if you don't feel the movement and you're not the person causing the movement, it's very challenging to tell is the world moving or am I moving? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just wondering um, in this uh, need to make up the story about the stimulus, it, yeah. what, how's that related to like uh, cognitive dissonance? Um, that's a good question. How is it related to cognitive dissonance? Um, let me think about that. So, can you give me an example of cognitive dissonance so I can... Well, it's like where you, you know, um, you basically kind of make up a story to match your beliefs. Yeah. So, I would say, um, in both, basically, we're making up stories to explain the world at all times. And how good we are at that depends. Generally, it's pretty bad, actually. So our perception of the world is pretty limited, and we're actually missing tons of information. And the question of whether or not it's a delusion really comes to whether or not it's really departing from what um, fits within our own model of the world. And so even a person who's experiencing the delusion, that delusion is departing from their own internal model and their own feeling of the world. Yeah. So what happens if you add dopamine? Okay, so um, so the question is dopamine, which is actually not where I'm going to go with this talk, but I will address it. So the traditional theories of schizophrenia are dopaminergically focused. So we're looking at an excess of dopamine causes schizophrenia. So the majority of antipsychotic medicines are, or actually all of proven antipsychotic medicines are all focused on inhibiting the D2 um, dopamine-like receptors in the brain. So these are very specific type of receptors that we think cause psychosis. Um, certain drugs can cause psychomimetic effects. Um, methamphetamine can increase it, dopamine and cause psychosis. It's very difficult to distinguish from, from a psychotic episode of someone um, having schizophrenia. So dopamine is involved. But it's not the whole story. We know these antipsychotic medicines, while they do a wonderful job helping the symptoms, we haven't cured psychosis. We haven't cured schizophrenia. And they don't even begin to um, help the negative symptoms or the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia. So that's not the whole story. So interestingly enough, you just segued me into my next slide, which is the neurobiology of schizophrenia, which was going to start off by saying, Traditions say dopamine's everything. And modern theories are actually um, bringing in what, the n methyl d aspartate receptor. And this is abbreviated the NMDA receptor. And this glutamate receptor, there's a theory that's actually there's a hypofunction of the glutamate of this glutamate receptor in schizophrenia. And there's enormous amounts of evidence supporting this NMDA receptor hypofunction 
theory of schizophrenia. It's not saying that dopamine is not part of the story. It's saying we have this other predictive coding receptor that's involved in the story. And we have neuropharmacological evidence, genetic evidence, neuroimaging evidence, and post-mortem evidence supporting this theory. Yes? What is the electrochemical difference in the intermediary cellular fluid uh, when you have excess uh, demethyltiaspirate? Oh, so... Um, so how does it change the electrical conditions to have more of that stuff outside the nerve? Oh, so it's not actually, it's not about having those specific ions in one place or the other. In the NMDA receptor, it's actually a calcium channel, uh, right? Calcium is a really powerful ion uh, transport, right? So yes, well basically all the ions are super important, and it's all about a negative positive balance at the appropriate time. And so what the NMDA receptors do is they change the gain on the neuron. So they change how easy it is for the neuron to fire. And so what they're changing is they're actually changing how easy it is to code these predictions and the precision of these predictions. Is that analogous to how easy it is for one neuron to code a prediction onto a distant neuron? Well, it's how easy is the one neuron able to talk to the next one. And they change how easy that is. And so these NM, so there's all of this evidence for the NMDA receptor in schizophrenia. And so I'm going to specifically focus on the neuropharmacological evidence. Um, and specifically, we're able to give healthy individuals, NMDA antagonists, in the laboratory environment that will transiently create symptoms that are schizophrenia-like, so these psychotomimetic effects um, that are very transient, so by the time the person's left, they have fully recovered. And so one of the most common drugs that we actually give in the laboratory environment is ketamine. Um, another similar NMDA antagonist that's well known um, is not used in the laboratory, but is PCP or also called colloquially like angel dust. And these both are NMDA receptor antagonists. And they've been shown that at sub anesthetic doses, so these are doses that don't cause somebody to fall asleep, that these NMDA receptor antagonists um, are able to induce these schizophrenia like symptoms, and importantly, not just psychosis like methamphetamine, but also imitate the positive, the negative, and the cognitive deficits of schizophrenia. And specifically, we see that blocking NMDA function, it both um, impedes the predictive error-dependent associative learning, and it promotes aberrant predictive error signals that are implicated in delusions. And importantly, NMDA receptor antagonists have systematically disrupted that mismatch negativity that's very basic level of auditory predictive coding across a number of studies in humans and non-human animals. And most recently in one of my studies, we see that ketamine also will disrupt predictive coding of speech. So to go back to that same figure you've seen a lot tonight, the predictive coding of speech, we see that we have this nice, healthy, speaking use suppression in healthy comparison to participants who come into the lab and that this is decreased in patients with schizophrenia. But if instead we have a group of healthy volunteers come into the lab and we tell them one day you're going to receive saline and one day you're going to receive ketamine. And we see that on the saline day, we have this strong suppression as we'd expect, the same as this other completely different, unique group of healthy controls that we um, collected actually at a completely different physical site. But then when you give these healthy individuals ketamine, we have this reduced suppression that is actually the same magnitude as the patients with schizophrenia. So we're seeing that actually by blocking NMD receptors alone using ketamine, we're able to mimic this specific symptom of schizophrenia. And why is this clinically important? Well, again, I said this current antipsychotic medication is really working on the blocking the dopamine D2-like receptors. And while, you know, while they do wonderful things and they really help people, they don't cure psychosis and they don't at all affect the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia. So we really want to study the neurobiology of schizophrenia better and of psychosis so that we can have new and better treatments that are actually hitting different and novel neural targets. So possibly the NMDA system, possibly the cholinergic system is also a very popular hot target right now being studied. 
And what we really want to understand is we want to be able to detect and treat schizophrenia early. We already know that the earlier we treat a new patient, a new person who's converted to psychosis with antipsychotic medication, the better their outcome is. So the earlier we can diagnose, the earlier we can treat and the better a person's outcome. And that's what, I mean, that's all we really care about is that people have healthier, happier, more fulfilling lives. So a summary for predictive coding. The world is really complex, multi-sensory environment, and the brain has to figure out a way to deal with that. And the way that a lot of scientists now think that the world, the brain deals with that is by creating these internal models, these beliefs about the world, and then forms predictions of new sensory stimuli. And then we compare this prediction with the new sensory stimuli in order to create prediction errors that are um, used to learn and to update new models. So thank you very much.
thing, I'm not an expert on major depressive disorder at all, and I'm not particularly well versed in the ketamine treatments. I'm aware of them, but I have not studied them extensively. Um, so from a cognitive neuroscientist, predictive coding, not a psychiatrist standpoint, what I see um, could be with these ketamine trials is, it is, as you said, it is well known that people with major depressive disorder can um, will often have problems where they fall into ruminative patterns and they'll have these negative oscillatory thoughts that are recurring and that this is a very negative downward spiraling habit, or I shouldn't even say habit, but um, neural occurrence that they struggle with. And that we seem to be seeing that a variety of treatments that in some way disrupt that pattern seems to be, seem to be extremely effective in treatment. So there's a number of different ways treatment-resistant depression is being attacked right now that are all showing some signs of um, effect for some subsets of this extremely complicated and diverse disorder. So ketamine is one. Um, for some people, there's something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is um, not electroconvulsive therapy that people think of as that electroshock therapy. But this is a more mild, um, changing the magnetic field of just a small part of your brain that um, that to transiently disturb and maybe turn off part of your cortex just for a couple of minutes and then it comes back online and can kind of reset it. That seems to show um, potential signs of treating major depressive disorder as um, some people are actually doing implanted um, stimu brain stimulators. So there's a lot of things that are really focusing on trying to disrupt these negative oscillations. What you're talking about is most um, a non-conscious um, activity of the brain. Oh yes, it's, yes, yes. And I am trying to formulate a question to tie it to what is conscious. And certainly, when one takes ketamine as a recreational drug, or other people um, you know, drink or or have. The novelty of messing up that tradition there on purpose tends to be um, of either um, good or bad results. Well, so hallucinations uh, are only negative and only are only are indicative of pathology when they are impeding a person's ability to function. So not everyone with auditory or visual hallucinations is psychotic, not by any chance. It's not actually uncommon for people to have auditory hallucinations as they're waking up in the morning or as they're falling asleep. Tesla and Edison, both some of the highest creative people. Yeah, so it's not saying that, but for pe most people with schizophrenia, these hallucinations disturb their ability to function and they're extremely distressing. So often the person's aware that the voices are, are real they're not actually expecting anyone else to hear them, but they're still distracting and upsetting, and in that way they're pathological. Um, the other thing is we're starting to see evidence that hallucinations are actually in some ways similar to dreams, and that dreamlike states are actually similar to hallucinations. So it's not saying that hallucinations are always bad and in all contexts. It's just saying they can be pathological for some people when it's actually part of their illness and disturbing to their social ability. Broad question, but can you comment in the sort of context of learning and creativity and as people get older, maybe they their beliefs get more set in certain patterns? Absolutely. So predictive coding, and I didn't go into this because that's a completely different talk and would be a great follow-up talk if maybe Zarina would even want to give it. And associative learning and reward processing. These are all explained by predictive coding. So actually, how do we learn? We learn from these prediction errors, even for things that are more conscious. So like, I see a cupcake, and I'm like, I want to eat that. That's delicious. This is something I've learned. These are paired associations. Um, negative associations also. You know, I know that after I walk across a carpet in the winter, that I might have a shock if I try to touch the doorknob. That's a very strong paired negative stimulus. So all of this, 
all of the more of these stimuli, and the more of these pairing between stimuli we have, the more we learn. And the more ingrained these are, the more we have these pairings, that's when we start to be more set in our ways. And that can be the negative side of predictive coding, is that you actually lose the ability to learn from a new situation because it's possible to ignore novel stimulus when it's at odds with your predictions, when it's too far at odds, then it can become more challenging to learn from that new information. So it's a great question. So I'm um, like more creative people also sometimes they have to try to stay away responses. You know, I don't I don't have a general response to more creative people. There's a lot of studies that show, for example, musicians will respond to um, they'll have different predictive coding responses. But to say in general, again, because we don't know what this optimal is, there's this waiting between new information and prior knowledge. And there's some sort of weighted average that becomes our new perception of the world. And how those two pieces of information are weighted are optimal for different people in different situations. Can I, can I actually clarify your from you? <coughs> When you say new, you mean subsequent, or do you mean novel? So new can be um, something novel, something completely novel, something you've never experienced before. But it can also be something that you've experienced before, but is novel in this context, novel in this situation. So new can mean different things. So what do you mean next? Because you're, you're talking about the expectation or the predictive coding. You're talking about uh, the, you know, the oh shit um, response where there's an expectation violation. Yes. And so. Uh, oh, sorry, I see what you mean. When I be, when I say new information, I'm saying subsequent information. Subsequent, that's so, okay. so the, the new information is um, you're now hearing my voice answer this question. So, okay. It's not that it's the shocking, next, but it's. The next bit of data. Yes, exactly. Yes. So in the, uh, the graphs, you display when the patients take. Uh, what yeah, patients taking ketamine yeah. uh, compared to the patients that took schizophrenia in the MMN where they were uh, listening to the repetition of their own voice. And the patients taking ketamine, I think it was either with them talking and listening, I can't remember, it's the red line, uh, when there was the deviant, uh, in the patients with ketamine, it, there was like actually a little dip in the line, but compared to the patients with schizophrenia, there wasn't really a dip. Is there some rationale behind that? or? So, um, so the, the comparison with the schizophrenic patients is actually looking at a person's own voice while they're actively speaking or passively. But small fluctuations in those lines can also just come out to an averaging. So I didn't put error bars on it, but I think a lot of those small dips in bombs would be actually used in margins of error. Yeah. Um, you touched briefly on this, but I'm interested in the concept of um, like, uh, no predictive So that's a really active, interesting um, field of research is this idea of perfect pitch. How is someone able to hear a pitch and immediately then convert that to, to saying what that name is, and also then being able to reproduce it? And um, that can come down to a person with per perfect pitch has better pitch discrimination. So someone like me who is not musical won't be able to hear the difference if you play two very close tones. They might sound the same to me. Um, and that just comes down to actual discrimination. Um, the actual ability to predict for the predicted coding and also probably means that when it comes to pitch, that these people have tighter boundaries, again, on what they think is an error. So if I produce a pitch that's probably within like four octaves of what I want to, I'm feeling pretty pleased with myself. But you know, somebody who is a perfect pitch, they'll sense the error if they're just a little bit off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can be really, and this is again that idea of like, what is optimal? Sometimes it's better to actually have worse predictions because you're allowed, there's a little, it's a little more fudge factor in life. Yeah, question back there. As we switch between states of like uh, conscious processing and predictive coding, is there a difference in how we perceive time? Um, well, so predictive coding is just, it's a, more of a basic neural system. Um, system that's constantly going on is how the, how our neural structure, how the hierarchy in the brain works. So it's not that we switch between 
actually actively perceiving and passively perceiving is that this passive perceiving is constantly going on while we're doing our brains doing other things too. It's just how the actual brain works in general. Um, this is great. So when um, you said that you So this is a really good question. Um, the idea is, is there, can, we, can we create a surrogate system to help patients with neural disorders? And right now, we're really, the idea of implanting anything, any neurons in the brain is really um, still science fiction. We're hoping that, I mean, the, the nearest future for that would be more like spinal cord injury, where it's a much simple, simple neural system. But, what we are, can I, can I start to answer this? What we are trying to do is, sometimes people with a neuropsychiatric illness have other parts of the brain that are intact. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out ways through training, with stimulation, through drugs, to harness these intact systems to supplement those that are broken. So rather than always trying to fix what's broken, can we, can we make a bypass? Can we make another route for this information to get through the brain? So some of you know cognitive behavioral therapy is about creating new strategies around problems. And some other more novel treatments, a colleague of ours is really working on positive mood induction as a way to enhance cognitive function for people with psychosis. So it's more about using what's already there. They don't experience, they might not be experiencing pleasure. 
They may be ablation, they don't want to get out of bed. They may um, have flat affect. They're now not modulating their pitch of their voice. It's extremely hard to maintain a social relationship with one of these people as a health, cognitively healthy person. So trying to figure out social, structural, alternative ways to have a support group is so important. And that's why I personally am very hopeful for this new digital health revolution in mental health. Not to supplant the current social network, but to facilitate it and create ways that people can reach out and talk to people. Maybe if they're a little bit scared, they'll at least be able to video chat and have alternative ways to create and maintain social structure. Emotional support animals are fantastic, and I think are highly, I feel like most practitioners should highly encourage for the right type of person who are able to continue to give care. Um, Co-living situations are wonderful, and there's nothing better for most people than a cohabitation situation. Yes. Um, do people with ADD have any kind of different response? I'm not highly versed on ADD or ADHD, but my guess is yes. Um, from the little I do know, uh, but I can't really address that. Yes. Um, so you said that predict coding is ubiquitous in everything that we do, like motion and stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, and in patients with schizophrenia, it's disruptive, right? Yes. So why don't they have like difficulty moving? There actually are motor deficits associated with schizophrenia um, that can be measured. They're subtle, but there are definitely changes in movement patterns, um, eye movements are aberrant, and um, sometimes general movements are disrupted, um, are more hectic or um, clumsy, and often, as I said, speech can um, become flat, so there's a failure to modulate the pitch of the voice, and it becomes very atonal. So there are these motor deficits. 